Welcome to my video series on DNA concepts for genealogy. My name is Dave Vance. I'm the uh, project administrator for the Vance Surname Project. I'm a co-admin for the L513 Haplogroup Project. I've written a few tools for DNA, for YDNA specifically. Uh, and I wanted to create this DNA concepts for genealogy series to introduce people to especially why DNA, but also DNA in general, and how it applies to genealogy specifically. Now, this is a series for genealogists. There's a, there's a lot of especially why DNA research that goes into making uh, analysis possible for deep ancestry, for cultures that have migrated across the world. Those are all very good pursuits. We're not going to be talking very much here about how DNA and why DNA specifically helps those pursuits. We're going to talk about specifically how genealogy research can be supported by DNA research. So I've split this into three videos. I've got a lot of a lot of busy slides. I've got a lot of busy thoughts. Um, so bear with me as we go through this. I've split it into three parts and I really moved the punchline first. My idea was to give you an idea of why I think why DNA can be such a powerful tool for genealogy first in this three-part series. So my first video here, I'm going to address the why use why DNA. Why is it useful for genealogy? How does it help us? What does it offer? My second video goes more into the genetics and the what do you get out of your test? What often confuses people? How do you use that effectively? My third video then goes into some other techniques for what you do with your results once you have them and how you apply those to your analysis and your genealogy research. So what I'll start with here, hopefully as a refresher for most people, is a one chart picture of each of the times of the kinds of DNA testing that are available today. Uh, I'll cover autosomal DNA, Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA. Not going to talk too much about xDNA here. Uh, the inheritance patterns are rather difficult, and it's a specialty item. You can get into that next if you want to. But for now, I'll just cover the first three. So uh, we'll talk about where it's available, what companies give it. Um, my little graphic here is how far back does it reach, starting with you, the generations going back in time. And then the model of the cell is just to point out where what it tests, where the, the components are that it, that it covers, and then the uh, ancestral lines that the individual kind of DNA testing follows. So again, most people know this about the types of DNA. I just wanted to cover it quickly so that people uh, have a chance to see the differences in the kinds of DNA that's available to them. So we'll start with autosomal. It's the most popular by far of the DNA tests. Uh, nearly every company that's available today in the market gives it. Um, it only reaches back about five to nine generations. So you typically start to lose DNA from all of your ancestors at that point, and the pieces of DNA that you've inherited from each of them get so small that you don't really, uh, that you can't really uh, tell the difference from that with noise. Uh, so it becomes harder to analyze your ancestry going back farther than that. Um, the little model of the cell, of course, shows that it does test all 23 of your chromosomes, and it follows every line going back in time, all of your biological lines, so both men and women can take the test, and you can map any of your ancestral lines. Of course, there's a lot of effort done in terms of splitting out the segments that you inherit and deciding which ancestors you got them from, um, but that's autosomal DNA, and it's a very different analysis process from Y-DNA and from mitochondrial. Uh, speaking of mitochondrial, that's the next one up. Uh, that's given by a smaller set of companies, but the major ones all provide it. It does go as far back as you want on the maternal line. Right now, the, the uh, female ancestor of all people alive today is thought to have lived around 140,000 years in the past. Um, and this does follow, both men and women can take it, and it follows the, the maternal line going back in time, so your mother's 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 and so on. It does actually test the DNA in the mitochondria that's not in the nucleus, it's a separate kind of DNA. That's mitochondrial DNA. Okay, now, the subject of our next three videos. 
YDNA. It's offered by a smaller set of companies. Family Tree DNA has the largest database, um, but a lot of other companies do provide it, uh, even ones that aren't on this list. Um, it goes back, as far as you like, the common paternal ancestor of all men is estimated to have lived right now around 240,000 years ago, but that does change over time. It only tests the Y chromosome, so that's this one little chromosome down here, uh, which is passed on by men, and so therefore it covers the paternal line, the father's 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 line, and so on. That's the overview of Y-DNA. Well, if I'm going to talk about what Y-DNA can offer, then let's talk a little bit about what you might expect it will offer that it really doesn't. So there's a lot of myths, a lot of things that people believe about Y-DNA when they get into it that turn out to not be true or not quite as true as they thought it was, as uh, they thought it would be. So the first myth that's very common, hear this all the time, is that women can't participate at all in Y-DNA testing. Well, it's just not true. Obviously, there's a lot of women who do participate very effectively in Y-DNA testing. They administer kits that they've asked their, their male friends, relatives, husbands, etc., to take, um, and they pursue those either for their own purposes or for the man who tested. Um, but women can also pursue their own paternal lines if they get their brothers, their cousins, their uncles to test, their fathers uh, to test. They can pursue their own paternal lines. They can even pursue other lines uh, if they get a male descendant of those lines to test. So, for instance, even if a woman doesn't know if she has a male relative of a particular line, she can take an autosomal test, find a man of that surname, or someone who knows that they descend in the male line from that side of their family, and then have them test and pursue it that way. So, a lot of women are very effective Y-DNA researchers uh, and deal with it all the time. The next myth is that men have found that they descend from the Irish king, Nile of the Nine Hostages, or Genghis Khan is also common, you hear. Um, there are studies that have found that a group of men descend from one common ancestor thousands of years in the past. That's true. A lot of us all descend from that kind of uh, ancestor who has fathered a lot of descendants, sometimes thousands of descendants, um, from, from several thousand years ago. No one has tied those conclusively to any past figure. So, Nile of the Nine Hostages and Genghis Khan have been proposed as possible ancestors, but there's no real evidence that link them to the lines that they were linked to originally. But yet people still do believe this. It's a very common myth to find in Y-DNA research. The next myth is that Y-DNA can tell me if my paternal line was a from a particular culture, or was a was from a tribe, or was from some group in the past. Now, if you happen to luck into matching someone who knew that for some reason, then yes, it could tell you that. But that's not through Y-DNA, that's through the information that they learned elsewhere. Y-DNA itself has been found in lots of ancient cultures. A lot of types of Y-DNA have been found in those cultures, and we can tell that Y-DNA spread around quite a bit. The mapping of ancient distributions is getting better every day. But as to whether your ancestors spent time among that culture is completely unknown. We don't know where all of the Y-DNA mutations started. We have an idea of what cultures they may have traveled with, but that doesn't mean that any of our ancestors traveled with them and didn't travel with another culture that also may have carried that Y-DNA. So, be a little careful when you hear media reports that they've identified a particular strain of Y-DNA as Scandinavian or is tied to any ethnicity because it's not that easy and no one has done that conclusively yet. Same thing is true with breaking through brick walls. Can Y-DNA break through brick walls? Absolutely. Yes, it can. Um, does it do it alone? Typically not. Typically it links you up with someone who has genealogy information that helps you break through your own brick wall because they knew something further back than you did. Or you, or you put together your two uh, sets of knowledge and you find out that your common ancestors must have lived in Spain or Ireland or Germany, and that helps focus your research and you find records. So it absolutely is a valuable part of your genealogy research by itself, it typically will not break through brick walls. You need 
to match up with people who have information who can help you. Uh, the other myth is that Y-DNA can tell me if I descend from a certain historical person. If I think I descended, if my family has said I descend from Abraham Lincoln, can I prove that? And the real answer is usually not. Um, the problem with Y-DNA is that uh, brothers and uncles and cousins can inherit uh, the identical Y-DNA. Sometimes there's a mutation that's different between those. If you can test a descendant of the historical person's father, their son, themselves, triangulate the mutations that must have happened in those ancestors, or better yet, dig them up and test them, you may be able to tell that a mutation happened in that person, and then every descendant of that person will be identified by that mutation. So in those rare cases, you can tell. Otherwise, you can't be sure. You can tell you're closely related to a historical person, but you can't tell that you descend from them for sure without a lot of testing and a lot of research on the various lines which descended from that famous ancestor. I'm going to talk now about how Y-DNA builds on our traditional genealogy. So, obviously this picture is made to build upon, to show you additional things, but this is my picture of where everyone's genealogy is today. We typically have named ancestors that we know, that we've traced back to a certain level. Now I've put this back to usually, I said 1600 to 1800, because that's a common brick wall for everyone. In some cases, obviously, if you're adopted, uh, you may not know more than an, a generation or two if you're looking for your biological ancestors. Uh, in some cases, if you've lucked into a royal line that you have good documentation that you go back to, you may know that you go back into the medieval eight times. So there are obviously exceptions to this, but most of us have good documentation. Sometimes we have theories of what might have happened before then. We have records that might show a couple of different possibilities, and we're not sure which one it is. So our lines usually end in a brick wall. The question marks are really where our named ancestors stop. And we're not positive. We may have an idea, but we're not positive of what happens before that. In that space is where Y-DNA can come into play. So what does it do by itself? Well, on the left-hand side, what can it find? We'll start with that. And drop down to the bottom, we're back in the known ancestors, our genealogy period. So it can confirm or correct, if necessary, the biological genealogy. Obviously, uh, adoptions, fosters, uh, changes of surname, um, lots of other reasons why the Y-DNA may not follow the line you expect your genealogy to, but um, if you do have a biological genealogy mapped out, it can confirm that, or it can find surprises sometimes. That's happened as well. But you really need your test by itself is not going to tell you who your ancestors are. You really need to match up with other descendants, so you need close relatives, usually people of your surname. You don't need your brother or your father to test necessarily, but you need cousins that are farther out that allow you to match up with people that go back in your ancestry with your common ancestors with them who go back in your ancestry and be able to see that they carry Y-DNA as well that comes from the same ancestors and give you some mutations that tell you about how far back those were and you can work your way back in time. Going back up a little bit on that chart, you hit a time frame where you don't know who your ancestors are. This is past your brick wall, but there are records that might still exist. You may find them in the old country where the immigrants came from. You may find them uh, even where they lived for centuries and you just don't have records back that far because the courthouse burned down or some other reason why the records have disappeared. In this case, you can start to narrow your search for those ancestors to specific lines or named men because you match other people who uh, descend from those lines and have some pieces of information that were handed down to them or that they found through their own research that allows you to put two and two together and come up with four. So you can name ancestors in that range. Um, it's typically hard to, but, um, but it, it certainly can be done. You go up a little bit further back in time, and this is the time frame where there are unknown ancestors where 
you you will never find records. There aren't there just aren't any that exist. There's no records. There's no uh, cemeteries that have anything. There's no names that of uh, places that they've been named after. There's just nothing that you'll ever find. And that and we'll all hit that point at some point when we go back in time in our genealogy. In this, but in this uh, time frame, it can still provide value because Y DNA can identify common descent and branching in specific lines. So I can join up with someone else. Again, I find a match and we go back to a common ancestor about that time. I can see where we match. I can see how far back approximately we match. And I can start to map out how our two lines then descended from that common ancestor. Perhaps a third match comes in, gives me another branch in that time frame, and I start to map my genealogy information without having any named ancestors to tie it to. And then if I go back even further, I get deep ancestry, anthropology time frame, where again, uh, with ancient digs, because a lot of ancient bones are being analyzed now for Y-DNA, and the current um, uh, distributions of Y-DNA help them tell what cultures and what ancient uh, peoples uh, were the carriers of certain Y-DNA and how it spread around the continents. On the right-hand side, what can't it find? So this is a little simpler, and it goes back to some of the myths that we talked about before. So, first one is it can't identify names and locations by itself. Obviously, this is biology, it's genetics. Uh, it doesn't have names and locations associated with it. Um, you can find common ancestors, but unless you have other information, records, genealogy, things that were left to certain descendants and so on, you'll never get those names. So you have to live with having ancestors that you may not name, uh, because if you only find them from Y-DNA, you won't necessarily have more information on them than what they carried in their DNA itself. It also can't usually distinguish between close male ancestors. We talked about that one. And why DNA can't usually identify the exact generation. I'll talk much later uh, in the third video about time estimation, and it is possible, but it is fairly generic. It's usually within a range of three to five generations at best. Uh, sometimes it can get a little more precise, but usually it's even less precise. So be aware that you can estimate that a connection was perhaps around the time of surnames when, it, when they got adopted, or in medieval times, or before uh, 1000 AD and that sort of time frame, but you're not going to find out that your common ancestor was born in 1672 uh, through Y-DNA. It's just not possible, at least not with the current technology. Will it be possible someday? I don't know. Um, but typically there's a, I said here, I said about a 20 to 30 percent error range. For those who know what I'm talking about here, my contention is it doesn't matter if you're using STRs or SNPs for that, um, but there's a lot of controversy within the field as to how to do age estimation in the first place. So bear with me, I'm going to cover it at a fairly high level, and if you really are interested, you can go into uh, a lot of detail with a lot of people on that. There's a lot of experts in the field who have varying opinions, and hopefully out of all of that, more precise uh, formulas, more precise approaches will be coming out. But um, I want to go back and talk about how we got to this point with Y-DNA. And to do that, I have to look at how many testers we have today in the various DNA fields. So the autosomal DNA has expanded. This is a chart actually of autosomal DNA testers. It comes from a website called the DNAgeek.com. Uh, it's very valuable to see the growth in autosomal DNA testing over the past um, uh, few years here. It's back to the end of 2012. Uh, and uh, Ancestry.com at the end of August, which is where this particular chart ends, Ancestry.com uh, went past the 15 million tester mark on autosomal DNA. Second, uh, in terms of size, is, uh, is going to be 23andMe, which just cleared 10 million. Um, and so you put all these together, and I'm sure well over 30 million testers have taken autosomal DNA and are in the databases. By contrast, Y-DNA, which is the little star down on the lower right-hand side of the chart there, Y-DNA has less than 750,000 testers as of August 17th, 
probably has grown a little bit since then. And when you add in the other, um, the other uh, databases other than family tree DNAs, you probably won't even reach 800,000. So let's say three quarters of a million uh, people have tested their Y DNA. That's large. It's much larger than any single DNA study has ever pulled together at one time. But it is still a drop in the bucket compared to autosomal DNA. So when you're looking for matches, be aware that there's still a lot of room for improvement in the Y DNA databases. And we hope this will improve over the next few years. Clearly, the prices have to come down for that because they're still a lot more expensive than autosomal DNA. But hopefully that'll come too. Now, what those quarter of a million, what those three quarters of a million testers have given us is this picture to start. So this is the ancestral tree of all men, all paternal lines. Um, what we're learning from Y-DNA is that we're all connected back to a point. Right now that point goes back to around 240,000 years ago. Um, this chart is a graphic representation of what we call the haplotree, the paternal descent of all men in this case. Uh, it's created by a man named Mike Walsh, uh, the L513 administrator, among other things. And um, it's a very useful chart. He's got a lot of detail on it that I'm not going to talk about here. But when he talks about a tapestry of individual lineages, that's an important point that I'm going to use as part of this uh, discussion of where we're headed with Y-DNA. So what we've done over the last five to six years really is this tree has really fleshed out quite a bit. So we've added a lot of detail, added a lot of mutations, added a lot. It started out in deep ancestry time frames. It started out very far in the distant past, long before genealogy, and has really come down close to present day, uh, has given us the ability to do very fine analysis going back in time over many years, even if we can't get very precise about the individual years that we're talking about. So um, again, the, the uh, common point at the top is believed to be around 240,000 years right now. The branching points on this are all marked by SNPs. Uh, we'll talk about the haplotree quite a bit, and we'll talk about haplogroups that are the groups under it that uh, are formed when a mutation happens, and all of the men who descend from that common ancestor then carry that mutation and are part of what we call a haplogroup if they're in that part of the haplotree. So we'll talk about that too. And just as an illustration of how far this has come over the past few years, I want to show just one small one small picture of the haplotree. This is the the, the uh, part of the haplotree that's under what's known as R1BL21, which is a SNP that's considered about 4,000 years old. It uh, It's a haplogroup as well. All men who are part of that haplogroup carry the L21 uh, uh, SNP mutation. And on the left-hand side, we've got the picture that we knew of back in 2011. So this was, we knew about 10... SNPs were reliably placed under uh, L21. That's this box here in the lower part of the chart is, is L21 and about 10 SNPs that were reliably placed. And then we had about another 16 that we didn't know for sure where they were, but we knew they were somewhere on that tree. Fast forward about eight years. At the end of September 2019, there were over 4,000 reliably placed branches, reliably placed SNPs under R1BL21 here. You can't even read this. I'm not asking you to. Just wanted you to see the difference that eight years makes in our knowledge of Y-DNA and the SNPs that now flesh out that part of the haplotree. And this is, R1B is a very well-tested part of the haplotree, so this difference is exaggerated compared to others. But there are now over 170,000 branches on the total haplotree. Our knowledge of the interconnections of paternal lines has vastly improved uh, with additional testing and with the uh, three quarters of a million testers that we have today. If we grow that number of testers, uh, we will know this much more in another, let's say, 10 years. Um, so it's a very exciting time to be part of Y-DNA research. It's a very exciting time to what it can do for genealogy. Um, and that's really why I'm looking at this as where I think this is going and what I think we can get out of this kind of an explosion magnified by another 10 years. So 
this chart really summarizes where I think we're going to be and what we can even do today uh, for the most part. So on the bottom again, we have the genealogies I showed before. This is all of our genealogies, all of our research, the named ancestors that we have that we've put together through other means, sometimes even perhaps with DNA research. And now we're trying to expand that with Y-DNA and go back in time. Um, if I jump up at the top, we've got the deep ancestry that uh, Y-DNA before was able to give us. So again, there's been a lot of study, a lot of uh, proposals of where certain Y-DNA was carried by, by the different cultures. We're starting to know more about that. Um, we're starting to find a lot of ancient digs and map out the ancient locations that we know the Y-DNA had already spread to by that point in time. It helps us with dating when these mutations may have occurred. Um, usually I say this period is somewhere around 1000 AD, 1000 CE to 1500, but that's obviously highly variable. Depending on the matches you have, depending on your genealogy research, depending on a lot of other things. But in between deep ancestry and genealogy of named ancestors, we have what I'm calling lineages, just for lack of a better term. These are genealogies, if you will, of unnamed ancestors. This is a period of time where you have interconnections. Again, the generations may be estimated, the time frames may be estimated, but you know that the connections happened because the Y-DNA tells you that there were mutations that were passed on by men who lived in those time periods, and those men had descendants who had further mutations, and so you can map the family relationships between those men, even if you can't ever name them. And all of our genealogies end in a brick wall today. Even if we push back some over time, we will always hit a point where we'll hit a lineage, where we'll have uh, an ancestry, uh, a set of branches, a set of interconnections that we won't be able to name. We don't know who they are specifically. We may not even know where they lived, although we may learn that over time. Um, but we'll be able to see how we all relate to each other through that network of lineages, through that network of branching connections. And that, I think, is the real power of Y-DNA. It can push back our genealogies. It can give us more information, and that will be a, a, a variable benefit to certain fields, certain people, certain lines, where we can map records to them, where we can map existing genealogies to them, where we can map other sources of information, and where the Y-DNA can help us prove a connection that we didn't know before. But we'll always hit a point where we won't be able to name the ancestors, but yet we can still extend our DNA research, we can still extend our genealogy research into the past, into branches and connections that we can identify, that we can join up with other descendant lines and show how we connect with the larger family group, if you extend the definition of family, past the named ancestors that you know that you descended from. So that's my map. On the, on the left-hand side, I've just put for, uh, for the discussion later that typically surname projects concentrate on the time of surnames. Um, and surnames, depending on what country your ancestors came from, may have occurred a thousand years ago, may have been more recently, but typically sometime in the time frame that I'm saying are, are where genealogies and lineages typically will live. And then haplogroup projects, we'll talk about those in a little bit, and somewhat um, geographical projects, although they depend on when the geography was settled and other factors. But haplogroup projects certainly tend to focus before genealogies in the time frame of lineages and deep ancestry. So when we talk about surname projects and haplogroup projects, that will become important. As an example of this, I just want to leave you with one example from my own surname project. So this is from the Vance surname project. It is what we call group two. That doesn't matter for this purpose. But originally, before we had DNA, before we had Y-DNA to look at, the Vance Family Association had mapped about a dozen lines down here. All these named ancestors were immigrant ancestors who came from mostly Ireland, but we didn't know exactly where. We weren't even sure they all came from Ireland. Um, and they ended up with an ancestor that the genealogy of their descendants could map back to, but could take no further. So these were our brick walls, all these named ancestors down here. 
the initial YDNA testing uh, back about six, seven years ago connected these colored uh, groups so that we knew they were related. We knew they were each related to each other back at some deep ancestry period, but we couldn't fill in the middle. We didn't know uh, anything about how these related to each other. We only knew the whole group was part of what we called group two. And in fact, we had a group two A and B back in the day because so that was about as far as we could go. Now, with the explosion of SNPs, with the explosion of information that we have, everything in the red circle is really a lineage or a set of lineages, depending on how you want to look at it. We don't know any of the names of those ancestors in that period. We have mutations. The yellow boxes are SNP mutations. The red boxes, the text in red, is uh, STR mutations. So we have a very well-mapped-out set of mutations that created the branching that shows the branching that was that happened in order to create these various descendant lines. We even have time frame estimates within about a hundred years um, that's bounded by both genealogy knowledge of when the immigrant lines came over, because they came over in the 17, sometimes 1600s, so we can start to say the common ancestor had to be before a certain point. And it's also partly through the analysis and age estimates that YDNA can offer. So we have this descendant lines that says we had ancestors at certain periods of time that had sons who created branching. We don't know how many generations there were necessarily. We don't know if there were other lines that we haven't identified yet. So it's only a partial set of lineages. We certainly don't have the whole families mapped out. We know that th everyone in this group likely lived in Ireland because all of these lines come from there and the odds of them having mutated uh, in ancestors that were somewhere else and all those lines having to come to Ireland independently is a little far-fetched. So our analysis says they likely came from Ireland, but that's a theory that we have to prove. And it gives us origin theories. It gives us places to focus our research. It gives us a way to research our ancestors to find evidence of branching where we may never identify the names of these ancestors, but yet we can see the family tree, if you will, of this group. And that's what we can get now. Another 10 years, when we have more matches hopefully added to this picture, more ability to get more uh, detail on the mutations, and hopefully even better time frames, we can really start to map this out even further. So that is what I want to offer to you as why you would go into YDNA, what the promise is. I can't promise you that you will find this. I can't promise you you will find uh, that you won't find something even better. I can't, in some cases, people do test their YDNA and have no matches and don't have anyone closely connected to them and have to wait for other people to test. So yes, it's true. Everyone's experience varies and we'll talk about that in the next few videos but I at least wanted to give you a picture of where I think YDNA is headed and why this is important to do. So thank you very much. This was my first video. Please join me for the second one.